Romans. We're going to be picking up uh, our discussion of Romans in verse 12. Uh, but as I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I always try to think of a good way to introduce the ideas, the key ideas that are, that are in this passage. Uh, the first idea that came into my mind, I told Colton earlier, is Lord of the Rings. How many of you know the movie Lord of the Rings? Or, if you're old school, read the books, right? The original books. Uh, but uh, one of the most interesting things, one of the most compelling things, I think, about all the books, after you've read through all three of them or watched through three of the longest movies in the history of the world, right, uh, is how this story finally comes to an end. And one of the most iconic uh, scenes of the story at the end of this long and in incredibly arduous journey uh, facing every obstacle imaginable, the hero of the story, the main character, this young hobbit named Frodo, the only one who throughout the whole story was able to resist the power of the ring, the symbol that represents the power of evil itself. He finally stands there at the end of his journey, uh, just over the raging fires of Mount Doom, uh, this place where the ring was forged, the only place that's capable of destroying this power, right? And as the hero stands there, just inches from the end of the journey, right, in anticipation of everything that's happened, uh, just as he takes the ring off of his neck to get rid of it forever, uh, he's consumed finally by the power of the ring. And as he looks at Sam, his, his helper that's been with him the whole time, uh, he says these words which live in infamy, the ring is mine. Think about that for a moment this morning. The ring that represents evil, the power of darkness. The ring that in each of our lives represents our own sin. And right when we get to the end, right when we can dispose of it, right when we uh, think we have control over it, we're overcome by it. And we accept it as our own, right? It's a pretty shocking scene. In fact, it's one of the most controversial and debated scenes from the entire series. If you Google this... You'll find all kinds of discussion on why Frodo was unable to get rid of the ring. Uh, but it does. It defies everyone's expectations. Every, everything that we think would happen at the end of this movie. Because how could Frodo, after everything that he had gone through, after everything that he had endured, after resisting the power of this ring for so long, come so close to the end, so close to destroying uh, this power of evil, yet still succumb to it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because even though Frodo was a hobbit, in truth, in the eyes of Tolkien, the, the guy that wrote this book, he represented humanity itself, uh, the condition of the human heart, which even at its best, even at its purest, even at its most heroic, if you want to think about it like that, is incapable of ever overcoming the power of sin and the power of evil. And that's why Frodo ultimately fails, because in truth... When it comes to the human condition, when it comes to all of us, we all fail, right? I don't know. Well, at least I do. The preacher does. No one else fails. Uh, but some of us, we all fall. According to Romans, it is everybody. We all fall short. And that's kind of the argument that Paul's made thus far in the book of Romans. None of us are perfect. Uh, in fact, even the best among us, those that can resist the power of evil, uh, in the end, they eventually end up failing. That's just the reality of the human condition because of our sin, because of our failure to do what's right. And because of that, sin and evil uh, continues to consume this earth. All the problems that we face in this world today is because we rebel against God and we uh, resist His will. And so it continues uh, to consume the world and it continues to consume the human heart. But thanks be to God, right, that's not the end of the story. For as we read in, in Romans chapter 5 last week, at just the right time, Christ came and He died for us. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time, Christ did what no human could ever do. He, in essence, destroyed the ring. And with it, what the ring represents, the power of evil itself. The ring that we were unable to destroy even at our best. And that's exactly the argument that Paul's made up to this point. Yet, as we look at the reality of our lives, the world around us in which we live, it's clear that we still wrestle with the effects of the fall, right? We still wrestle with sin. We still wrestle with the evil in this world. Even though Christ has already defeated death, hell, and the grave, uh, 
We still stumble. We still sin. And I don't know about you, but every person that I've ever known, we still die. We still face the consequences of sin. It's funny that we see how obvious death is in our world today, right? Everybody dies. It's pretty hard to deny that. But we think that sin doesn't exist anymore in our world today, right? It's all in the eye of the beholder. Well, where do you think death comes from? Paul tells us in the book of Romans it comes from sin. Uh, so that kind of begs the question as we come uh, to this transition in today's passage. How do we as Christians reconcile these two ideas, this reality that Jesus has put to death sin and the reality that even us under Christ sin, right? Uh, well, as we consider Paul's greater argument in Romans 5 beginning in verse 12, I think we see the answer. And it comes by understanding three things. And if you want to follow along in your outline, we're going to look at these three things. The reign of death, the reign of life, and the reign of Christ. And those are going to be our three points this morning. So if you will, uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 12, and we'll begin considering this first point, uh, the reign of death. So as we turn our attention once again to this argument, this overarching argument that Paul's been making within the book of Romans, we arrive at another passage of incredible theological importance. It's kind of uh, something that we encounter throughout the book of Romans, but this is another one of those passages that people think is one of the most important passages in all of Scripture. Because here, within only 10 verses, Paul really unpacks everything and summarizes everything that he's been discussing up to this point. Uh, he, he addresses one of the most important ethical and religious questions that there is. Think about this. Not only why are things the way that they are in our world today, uh, why the world is the way that it is, but more importantly, why do human beings whether we're a believer or unbeliever, whether we're Christian, Muslim, Hindu, atheist, or whatever else you use to define yourself, why do we all sin? Have you ever even wondered why we all sin? Why do we, as a human race, seem to be so bent and so predisposed to sin? Uh, well, look at what Paul says in verse 12. He says, therefore, in summary of everything that we've covered thus far, we can safely conclude this. Just as sin came into the world through one man, one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. And then he gets into this kind of this riddle of back and forth. We're going to unpack it though. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, let's be honest with each other. How many of you have read that on your own and said, what in the world does that mean? I have no idea. It's a little, it's a little tricksy. Since we're talking about uh, Lord of the Rings, it's a little tricksy, like a tricksy hobbit, right? And some of you would get that. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But what is Paul saying here? Uh, well, although it does seem a bit confusing at first, when we kind of break it down, when we dissect it into smaller pieces... I think it's much easier to understand what he's making here. Here, Paul is addressing kind of three fundamental things, fundamental truths uh, to understanding the reality of the human condition, uh, our propensity towards sin. First, the birth of sin, how sin came into this world. Uh, secondly, the transmission of sin, how this sinful nature came from Adam and infected us all. And finally, the consequence of our sin, which is death, but death within the biblical understanding, means two things. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. And so that's the three things that I want to unpack just briefly this morning. Uh, probably about 45 to 60 minutes that we're going to unpack this, okay? Uh, not really. When I went like that, I felt like Donald Trump doing his... I'll have to work on that. But uh, let's unpack this just a bit. So uh, Paul says in verse 12 that sin entered the world through Adam. It's a passage that's pretty simple, but I think it's one that we take for granted. Because sin is not something that God ever willed. Do you know that? Sin is not something that God created. In fact, sin is not something that God could have created. Uh, because it's to act opposite of how God would act. Uh, the very nature of God precludes him from all culpability when it comes to sin. Uh, he can't sin. He can't create sin. The scripture tells us that he cannot be tempted by sin because to sin means to act in a way that God wouldn't act. So God can't act differently than God would act. So God, in his very nature, can't sin. Uh, 
so to sin is to do something that God would never do. It's in its simplest of forms uh, to depart from God's standard of righteousness, from God's standard of best, what's best for our lives. Uh, so all sin is an act of rebellion, and it's not just an act of rebellion against the person that we're sinning against. It's an act of rebellion against God, and that's why all sin is ultimately against God. And that's exactly what Adam did. When we go back to the beginning of this story that Paul's talking about here, when we go back to Genesis, uh, Adam willingly chose his way over God's way, something that we all do. He willingly chose to ignore God and His Word. God gave him one command, and he willingly chose not to do that one command. Did you ever do that growing up? As soon as your parents told you not to do something, that's the first thing that you wanted to do, right? And you wait over the consequences in your mind. What benefit am I going to get out of doing whatever it is that they told me not to do? And what punishment am I going to receive? Well, that's exactly what Adam did. Uh, God told him not to eat of the fruit, uh, but that's the first thing that they wanted to do. And we've been fighting with that ever since this day. The fruit of chocolate cake, the fruit of ice cream, all these things that we love that we can't eat, right? Uh, if we want to lose weight, uh, that really has nothing to do with it. I just threw that in there to see if you're awake. Every once in a while, I have to see. We shall not all sleep because we won't all come to church, right? But we will be changed no matter what. Uh, anyways, back to the story. But think about the implications of what Paul is saying here. Uh, because of what sin is, an act of rebellion against God, in actuality... Adam did so much more than just disobey God's word. He did so much more than just choose to eat of some fruit. Paul says that he actually brought this thing called sin that didn't exist beforehand into the world. And that's precisely how Paul and the, the writers of the New Testament understood it. As this evil, destructive power that consumes our hearts. Sound familiar? It's like the ring. And brings about death and destruction. That's exactly what sin is. So Paul says when Adam sinned and just he brought this destructive and rebellious force into the world. A force that not only consumed our hearts, the hearts of every man. But actually distorted our perception of God. It distorted our perception of right and wrong. And that's why it's so hard for people uh, without the power of the spirit to see right and wrong. And, and to choose to do what's right. Sin separated us from God. And as a result, death came. Because death is separation from God's presence. And that's why it always goes hand in hand with sin. Just consider uh, God's warning in Genesis 2. We read in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. And you know what Adam said there? You're, you're going to have to be really able to get this reference. He said, don't call me Shirley, right? But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you do, you will surely die. Uh, he, he called him Shirley again just because he said, don't call me Shirley. But that's, that's what Adam did. Uh, God told him, don't eat of this one fruit. And the very first thing that Adam did was eat of the fruit. But I want to look at the implications of that. When they ate of the fruit, when the woman ate, saw that it was good, that it was pleasing to the flesh, that it was pleasing to the eye, and that it was good for food. She ate, and Adam did the same. But what's the first thing that happened? We read in Genesis 3 and 7. You can write that down if you want to look at it later. That when they ate, immediately their eyes were open. They immediately knew that they were naked. They immediately had this sense of overwhelming shame, this sense of overwhelming guilt. And so in one of the most tragic verses in all of Scripture, we read in Genesis 3 and 8, And when they heard the sound of God, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, something that they had often done every day, walking together, this time something was different. This time they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. That's what sin does. It separates us from God. It makes us fearful and shameful. Of his presence. And that's what sin ultimately does. It brings death. And it brings death by separating us from God. By alienating us from his presence. So through Adam's sin came two things, Paul says. 
First, it brought this spirit of rebellion into the world, a spirit of sin that corrupted the human heart and everything that God created us to be. It corrupted our heart, it uh, corrupted our mind, it corrupted our will, everything about us, so that we can't think right, so that we can't do right, so that what we seek and what we desire isn't right, so that we consistently and continually rebel against God and His law. And that's what we face every day as human beings. But most tragically of all, so that when we experience God's presence, we run away in shame and disgrace. And that's the curse of sin. That's why sin always leads to death, because it consumes our hearts. It distorts our perception of God. And ultimately, it shatters our relationship with Him. Sin's not something that a lot of people like to talk about today. But in truth, it's one of the most important things because it separates us from the most important person, and that's God. And it ultimately shatters not only our relationship with God, but every relationship that we will have in our lives. And that's why we have to first find peace with God before we can find peace with anybody else. So Paul tells us in verse 14, because of this, because of Adam... Uh, and every subsequent man that ever followed Adam, because we all chose to sin, because of our willingly re- uh, a willing rebellion against God, death reigned from Adam to Moses. You could say that death reigned over us even today, but it's for an entirely different reason. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. So in other words... Death continued to reign in the hearts of man. It wasn't something that just stopped with Adam. It was something that continued even with the giving of the law. Because with the law came even more transgression. Because it only brought the knowledge of sin. Uh, So here it says something that's a little bit difficult to understand. It says, over those whose sin was like Adam and over those whose sin was not like Adam. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, Adam knew God's law and he chose to disobey it. But there's lots of people that have lived throughout the history of time that didn't know God's law, but they still chose to live against it. Uh, This nature of God's law that's intuitive. Remember when we talked about that back in Romans chapter 2? So both people, those that know God's law and those that didn't, the whole human race, in other words, was infected by this spirit of sin. And they become corrupted and capable of seeking God or knowing Him. That is, until the arrival of the one who was to come. I like how Paul words it there because he is the one who always was to come. Even before Adam ate of that fruit, the Bible tells us that he is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God had already made a provision for our restoration. And that man, of course, was named Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our second point, the reign of life. So before we move on to the second half of Paul's argument here in verse 15, consider this case that Paul has made up to this point. If we want to know why the world is the way it is today, if we want to know why we as the human race uh, are so bent on death and destruction, why there are none that are righteous, why there are none that seek God, Paul says we have to go back to the very beginning. When the very first man, a man named Adam, rebelled against God and he brought this spirit of sin, this spirit of rebellion into each of our hearts. And just sin became like this virus that had absolutely no cure, that infected and consumed the whole human race. If you want to think about it like an apocalyptic movie, it made us all zombies. And because there was no humans that were left, there was no one to save us from being zombies, right? Uh, That's in just what Paul is saying here. Because everyone sins, the whole human race was infected. The whole human race was corrupted by this virus. There was no way to ever escape. That's the end of the movie. We all die, right? No, no. Thanks, thankfully, that's not the end of the movie. Although there is no way that we could ever restore what had been lost because we were all trapped in this helpless state, there was a second man, a second Adam, Paul says, a man named Jesus Christ, a man who was not infected with the virus of sin and rebellion, not only because he never chose to sin, but because he was incapable of sin. Because he was the son of God. And that's why Jesus has to be the son of God. He couldn't have just been another man. And unlike Adam who brought sin and judgment and death into the world. Christ brought something of incomparable value into the world. Something we must never forget as God's people. Something that each of us need on a daily basis. He brought the gift of grace. Adam brought sin 
death, and condemnation. But Jesus Christ brought grace. Look at what Paul says in verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. In other words, this free gift of grace, the, the consequence of Christ's work as opposed to the consequence of Adam's work, is unlike the curse of Adam in every possible way. In fact, it's the cure for our condition. Look at what he says in the second half of verse 15. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. There's a lot of things happening there, isn't there? But in other words, uh, one sin brought the spirit of rebellion and sin into the world, but all of our sins brought even more sin into the world. Uh, but this one gift, even in the midst of condemnation, brought justification, a right standing before God. And we'll talk about that. We'll unpack that in just a bit. Uh, verse 17, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, because of uh, what Adam did, death reigned in all of our hearts, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And that's the truth of the Christian life. See, when Jesus came into the world, He brought with Him the cure for our condition. This life-changing, life-transforming power of grace. The only thing that's able to reverse the curse, the only thing that's able to overcome the consequence of Adam's sin, the only power that can overcome the sinful condition of the human heart and turn us back towards Him. That's why there's no other way that we can stand as justified by God. That's why Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, the only way to the Father, because He's the only cure, right? See, grace is so much more than just being forgiven. That's how we look at it. Because we think about our sin in those terms. We owe God something. We need to be forgiven. But grace is so much more than that. It's the life-changing power to never be the same again. It's a life-changing power that overcomes the power and the influence of the enemy. Uh, it actually changes and transforms the condition of our heart. It's the power to not only be forgiven, but it's the power to go and sin no more. To walk in obedience just as Jesus walked in obedience. It's not something that we do on our own. It's not something that God just, just haphazardly expects of us. It's something that He equips us for. It's something that He gives us through the power of His grace. The power to be changed. The power to be set free. To live a life of life rather than a life of death. And to live a life imparting life to this world around us rather than imparting death, which we've been doing since the very beginning. And that's exactly what the Christian life is. I know this is pretty simplistic, but it's living like Jesus lived. It's actually being a Christian. It's being like Christ. And what did Christ do? When Jesus came into the world, unlike Adam, who brought this reign of death, Jesus brought the reign of life everywhere he went. Where there was suffering, he brought healing, he brought relief. Where there was sickness, he brought restoration. Where there was heartache, he brought restoration, he brought peace. But most importantly of all, through his death on the cross, where there was only sin, condemnation, and death, Jesus brought forgiveness, reconciliation, and life. Maybe that's where you are today. Dealing with the weight of your sin, dealing with this feeling of condemnation, dealing with a life of death, not just physical death, but death of everything that you come into contact with because your heart's not right with God, Jesus is the answer. and He's the only answer. Jesus did what no other man could ever do, and He paid the price for our freedom. Freedom from our old life, freedom from our past, freedom from the person we are, uh, but most of all, freedom from our slavery to sin and death. There's only one caveat. There's only one requirement. We have to let His grace reign in our life. We have to let Jesus Christ reign in our life. And that brings us to our final point, the reign of Christ. Look at what Paul says in verse 17, and we're going to go ahead and, and conclude there. There's two words that change the whole impact 
of this verse. It says, for if, I don't like things that start with an if, right? <laughs> because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man. Much more will everyone. No, unfortunately, that's not what it says. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And that's the real tragedy of it all. See, on the cross, Jesus paid the ultimate price for our redemption, for our healing, for our forgiveness, for our freedom. In Christ, we're given this free gift of eternal life. There's only one caveat. There's only one requirement. It's only given to those who are going to receive it. And even though it's free, even though Jesus has bore the penalty for our sin and our shame, there's so many across this world who will hear the gospel message and say, you know what, I'll pass. But in truth, it's the only way we can ever destroy that ring. The only way that we can ever have a change in our life is to find a new master for our soul. And in the end, you can choose for that master to be one thing, according, according to Paul and really the whole of the Bible. You can let the power of sin reign in your heart and your life and with it the penalty of death. Or you can let Jesus Christ reign in your life and with it grace and life. Christ himself said you cannot serve two masters. For in the end, no matter what you do, you're going to end up loving one and hating the other. You can't serve God in this world. You have to choose who's going to be the Lord of your life. But if you're willing to trust in him, if you will, like Abraham that we encountered a few weeks ago, consider God wholly trustworthy and let him truly reign and in your heart and in your life. You'll find victory over everything in your life, victory over your past, peace in your present, and hope in your future. Not because everything's going to be perfect, but because you'll be living with the one who has overcome the power of this life, the power of death. Every day we're given this opportunity to choose life or choose death. To choose who we're going to let reign over our life. But today as we consider the truth of Romans 5. The truth of who Jesus is and the truth of what Christ came to do. I ask you. Choose Christ. No matter what you're going through today. No matter what you may be facing. I can tell you what the answer for your life is. It's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can give you freedom for your soul. He's the only one that can give you peace in the midst of the storm. And this morning. We come to a conclusion, I'm reminded of the words of Revelation, where Jesus stands and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man comes to me, if any man will let me in, I will let him come and eat with me. He's standing at the door of each of our lives this morning. The question is, are you going to let him reign? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful today for your word. Lord, I pray that the truth of this passage would speak to the hearts of each and every person here. God, help us to realize what you've done for us and help us to trust in you with our whole hearts and our whole lives. We thank you, God, for what you've done. And we thank you for the power of your word. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.